BreastGirls.org for the facts you need on breast cancer. <coughs> Brought to you by Susan G. Coleman and the Ad Council. All right, Mr. Lee, Mr. Michael, the straight talk with Dean and Mark, you are now on the line. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, guys. I appreciate appreciate you having us. Appreciate you being on, Mike. Mike, and we have no uh, family relationship that we're aware of, maybe some distant cousin or something (laughs) down the line or whatever. I'm not even sure which part of the world Mike is originally from. He can tell us a little bit about that. But, Mike, I've got to ask you this, and then we'll get into some discussions about some of the issues that are impacting us both because of what's going on with COVID-19, but just in general. Because I know Mm -hmm. when you first came on the school board, there was issues that you were concerned about, and this was way before COVID, like trying to make sure that um, our uh, youth, and particularly our uh, black male youth, were seeing people that looked like them in the classroom, of course, dealing with things like the gangs and things of that that were on there uh, that we, we faced in the school system, whether it's here, whether it's in New Jersey, whether it's wherever, and Dean's actually in the New Jersey area and everything. But the question I've got to ask you is if somebody had told you when you first got involved in education, and tell folks a little bit about what brought you into education, but if somebody had told you when you first got into education, say some 10 or 15 years ago, that you would be living in a time of COVID where you're trying to figure out what to do with education. I mean, I had the pleasure, and we had her on last week, I believe it was last Friday, of having an educator from London, and, you know, they went to doing like, just like we're doing. They didn't have their standardized testing, and they didn't, and a lot of their teachers were having to do Zoom classes and online classes, and I know that that's what we've been doing as well as having drop-off spots for our kids that are wanting to get that um, balanced meal, and we know that the schools sometimes provide a place for those balanced meals. But this is a new era. It's a new day that we're in, and if somebody had told you, you know, 15 years ago, hey, Mike, you're going to become the head of the school board, and during the time of your tenure, you will be facing a <laughs> pandemic. What would your reaction have been? I would not believe them for one second that we'd be in a situation that we are in today. Um, so first, let me give you a little background. I am not an educator. I'm actually in technology. Uh, my real, my full job, full-time job is in technology. Um, uh, but I've been on the school board for about six uh, six years now. Uh, my dad was in the military, so we moved around a lot. Every four years, we moved to different places. But my lineage, my par- my parents, my grandparents, my uncles, aunts, and everyone is from Alabama. So um, if you have any relatives, <laughs> Mark, in uh, Alabama, Birmingham specifically, uh, we may have some relations down the line somewhere. I don't know. Um, but about six years ago, a little over six years ago, when I joined the school board, my oldest son had just started school. Well, he was in kindergarten at that time. When I decided to run, it was 2014, and um, um, I started noticing there was a deficit of uh, of business finance, contractual understanding, things like that on the board. I think it was a, it was a little bit of a deficit, and I felt that I could come onto the board and help you know, help the board and the district understand a little bit more about finances, the budgeting, you know, make sure we're asking the right questions. We had just come off of a year where um, the chief financial officer and, you know, and, and the district had lost, nine, I think it was like $19 million or something for a little bit, and they found it at the end of the year. And there was just some questions that needed to be asked, some experience that needed to be done. And so uh, I joined and you know, my background, I've been coaching for about nine years, you know, I've been mentoring, I've I've done a lot of different things. And yeah, one of the things I really was interested in is trying to get more uh, African American teachers in the district because we all know that uh, when a when a black student sees a teacher that looks like them or a Latino students see the teacher that looks like them, their chances of graduating and finishing school skyrocket, you know, jumps up to 90%, 95%. I can't remember the actual statistics, but it's an extremely high jump to when, uh, where instead of where students don't see a teacher of color. So uh, when I was growing up, like I said, I was in, my dad was in the military. I didn't have a black teacher all the way through. I don't remember having one black teacher until I got to college. I went to Alabama A&M, and it was obviously a culture shock because I'd never, never seen that. I'd never seen black educators. My mom 
was a substitute teacher. Um, and uh, my dad, after after he retired from the military, uh, he became a school counselor, a guidance counselor, but I never had a, an actual uh, teacher who looked like me. And I know the importance of that, and I wanted that for my children as well. I have three children in the school system. So that was one of the things. Also, technology was one of the things. When I came into school, uh, coming into the school board, we were about a six-to-one district. That means there, for every six students, there's one computer. Now we're at about a, a, a three-to-one. And hopefully, the way it's looking now with all of this going on, we're looking at being a one-to-one, meaning that every student in Durham Public School should have a computer that you could, if needed, take home, including, you know, hotspots, you know, to connect to the Internet and so forth. That's what we're looking to do at the beginning of this next year. So now we're in this position. Now we're in this position where everybody's at home. Who would have thought that schools across the nation would be canceled? I'm just sit and think about that for a minute. Schools are canceled for the rest of the year, and we don't even know if we're going back on time in the fall because of this. So the world has completely changed. Everything that we're doing is completely different. Yeah, and you actually raised an interesting question. That was actually one of the things that the lady from London talked about was the fact of can they have some poor areas as well as some different ethnicities and things mm-hmm. of that, but trying to make sure that all of our kids are able to get a computer and things along that line. And I do know that we have even here in Durham some poor areas. So um, mm-hmm. has the corporate America stepped up in the sense of being able to help these folks get computers or are people getting donations? Are y'all still short on computers or are we at the point right now where a lot of people are doing homeschooling and we know that that's what's going on right now, that they are actually able to get the access? Because we know that the libraries right now at least in the phase we're in now, are still shut down. I mean, if we go to phase one mm-hmm. or phase two, then the libraries may be open and then they can have access there. But right now they have to do it from home because they can't even do it in the restaurants because the restaurants are pretty much, you know, either take out and or um, like you can go pick it up or take out or pick up. So there's no sitting down mm-hmm. with even those that have Wi-Fi. So the question is, how are we doing in right here in the Triangle area? And then the other thing I was just wondering about, you said that, you're not sure when we're going to open, but I think I'd read somewhere that they're speculating that we might be ready to go. At least they want the state to go in August. So I'm guessing that's the fall semester, but it sounds like you're not 100% sure that that's going to happen. A lot still has to depend on the testing. And when I say testing, I'm talking about the medical testing and what happens in that realm. So I just want to know what some of your thoughts are in terms of Mm -hmm. whether we will actually be up and running by the fall. And also if we are doing a good enough job with having the kids have access to the uh, technology that they need in this day and age. Right. Well, um, uh, corporate America has stepped up quite a bit. I, I join a call. I'm on a, a one call or another about seven times in a week not on the weekends, but just, uh, but it's dealing with what we're going through right now with uh, COVID-19 and the effects that has caused, you know, the domino effect. But corporate America has really stepped up, and we're at a place right now to where there's a we're making a plan, we're we're developing a plan on what every child having a computer in during public schools looks like, and what does that look like for the future? So we're looking at a five year plan, where you know where you know you have to you're going to have to get more computers than you do than you have students because there's going to be breakage, there's going to be you know loss, you know uh, maintenance kind of issues. So you're going to want to, you're going to have to have, you know, a plan for that. There's going to be carts involved, you know, in the schools you want to have carts. There's going to be a lot of different things that, that are going to have to be taken into account before, um, if we're going to maintain it, if, we, if it's going to be sustainable over the next five years. And we're developing a plan right now. And the, the corporate America here in the triangle, they stepped up and they said, look, tell us what the cost is. Tell us what it is per year. The county commissioners have been extremely gracious in funding our projects, funding the things that we need, and they've 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 said that they are willing to step in and help with that. So we've had a lot of we've had a lot of positive momentum going into the technology, you know, uh, to the technology needs of our students. Even Verizon and a couple other companies are saying, "Hey, tell us how many." of your students need, you know, hotspots to connect while they're at home. 
Let's see how we can get those provided. And now we're estimating about 30, 35% of our students don't have access to a computer or internet or high speed internet at home. The majority of our students, the high majority, have some sort of smartphone at home. And although you can connect to, diff to get different schoolwork or watch different videos, a smartphone isn't necessarily the best idea to have a student trying to do their schoolwork on it. Uh, although some do, my son is one who we have computers here, we have high-speed Internet, but he loves to sit on his phone and do, do type his papers and do everything like that in, for the seventh grade. But that's just not optimal. So what we want to do is we want to make sure everyone who needs a computer can have a computer along with high-speed Internet access. And how do we manage that? Mm -hmm. Now, okay. as it relates to going no, – go ahead. No, so go ahead and continue. Yeah, I was going to say, as it relates to actually going back to school in the fall, um, I don't think anybody really knows right now. And um, I tend to stay, as far as, you know, making these kind of choices, I kind of stay on more of the conservative side where you're saying, look, are we going to have enough testing? Are we going to have something to to address if someone's already ill, you know, like is there a vaccine or is there some kind of treatment or that sort of thing. Now, we do we do know that although there are, you know, the younger children who who have COVID-19, it's just not a, it generally presents itself as, a, as mild, but still taking it back home is where there's a problem. And so having children in school, where there's nothing as a barrier to protect against that, that's going to be a challenge. And so, you know, there, there are speculations, you know, we would start on time because we generally would start at the end of August. But you have to understand we have year-round schools as well. They start in July. So if, if school can't open up in July, what does that mean for the year-round schedule? Do that, does that mean that they have to start school in an online capacity and then go in once school is open? How does that work as far as, you know, you know, how does that work as far as the school year and things like that? So there right now there's really no one that really knows for sure what it would be, what the uh what the opening will be. I'm hoping it's August cuz I would love to start the school year out and uh as normal as we can for our students, but I I think it's going to be even further delayed. Yeah, I would not be surprised at a further delay either. I do want you to stay on the phone call and everything. And got a team. I'm looking at the studio as well, and I see we've got a couple of folks in, and I want to bring a couple of them into the conversation. So I don't want you to, to get off. But before even bringing in Shale uh, Comerford, who's a dancer, and I want to hear her from her, and then I want to hear from Marco Greenberg, who's a national person and everything, and then Hosan, who's a uh, poet. But before bringing in uh, Shale and her dance group and finding out what they're doing, the one thing that has really surprised me with this is um, two things. One, you just mentioned it with your, uh, I think it was your son, but you were talking about how they are doing their homework. And I've heard this even from college kids on their phone. I mean, they're literally doing their papers on their phone and all of that. That actually just shocks me. Like I said, I know just growing up, I was good with my electric typewriter and my manual typewriter. And then I moved on <laughs> to laptops and, but I'm hearing of kids that are actually doing their papers on a phone, and that just amazes me because I'm sitting there going like, because I think I've talked to a friend of mine who's got um, a teenage uh, daughter who's, I think she's either a junior or a senior, but she was talking about, he was talking about the fact that she's literally writing her papers on her phone, and I'm sitting there going like, the phone is kind of small, so I don't know how you manage to write a whole paper on a phone, but apparently that's the norm. And the other thing that I was just curious about your thoughts on um, before I bring in a chalet and everything was, I'm hearing some people speculating that they're thinking, you know, the, they talk about the new normal, that this is leading to the new normal. And part of the new normal that I'm hearing theorized is that the school print, meaning the footprint of the school, might be smaller, meaning that we might go to these kind of like days where the kids are, say, coming to school on Monday and Wednesday and the other kids are coming Tuesday and Thursday as a way to have some distance and some separation. And also maybe half the classes are online and half the classes are at the uh, campus itself. Is that something that you're hearing in your conversations? Because like I said, this is just stuff that I'm reading or hearing people talk about. And sometimes it's in bigger environments like New York and LA and Miami. But I was just wondering, is that something that's being conversated about even with us? Make methods to maintain the kind of things that the CDC and some of these health experts 
once with maintaining social distancing, even after 